We are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts 2013's Oz the Great and Powerful film. So since this video is probably going to get long, I'm going to briefly start by saying the review is going to be like, I thought the movie was good, I wouldn't quite say great, I felt like it, like, it mostly got the reaction out of me that it was going for, like, whether that was to, to laugh or to get emotionally involved, to, to get scared of something, not really scared, but, you know, to get into the, the creepiness. But I'm not sure I would say that, like, while I cared about the characters while I was watching, they're not really going to stay with me afterwards. Yeah. So the, re oh, and the review itself will probably be, there will be some jokes and such. It's not going to be a super serious review. But yeah. And since the video is probably going to be long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. So, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie contains, and I'm going to be discussing some of the following potential triggering content. Torture, kidnapping, ableism, xenophobia, death, body horror, grief and mourning, bullying and other abuse, and that is, yes, that's, those are them. So the movie is rated PG, and so is this video. Yeah, PG for sequences of action and scary images and brief mild language. I gotta admit, I really would have thought, based on the content, I would have thought PG-13, but that's why I'm not in the MPAA. According to Wikipedia, Raimi had to edit the frightening nature of several scenes to secure Disney's desired PG rating for the MPAA. And according to IMDb Trivia, this is Sam Raimi's first film to be rated PG in the United States. All his previous directorial films have been PG-13 or R. Now, whether you hate or love this movie or the entire Oz franchise, I don't have any problem with you. And the if, if you express a viewpoint that disagrees with something I say in this video, the only thing I ask is that you keep it respectful, and I will keep it respectful in my replies. If you write something hateful, whether it's directed towards me or anybody else, most likely I'm just going to ignore you. And I am not claiming to be, f not everything I say is a factual statement. A lot of it is just my opinion. We don't have to agree on whether or not we like or dislike something about this movie or any other movie. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch. So I, at least in some parts of this video, speak faster. And that is almost it. I'll just very briefly say this is probably the only Oz movie that I'm going to, you know, do a video on. I'm not currently planning on, you know, Disney Plus does have Return to Oz, but yeah, just not currently intending it. I'm going to criticize some real people and ideas that real people believe. Let me be very clear. I do not condone any harassment or bullying. You can express an opinion, but do not harass or bully anyone. And... Yeah, so... Since this is... This is a Sam Raimi movie, I... Let's see... Yeah, so... I have made a ranking 
of the all of the Sam Raimi movies that I have watched, other than this one, ranked from worst to best. Spider-Man 3, Drag Me to Hell, The Quick and the Dead, The Gift, Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, Evil Dead 3, A Simple Plan, and Darkman 1. Technically speaking, I have not sat down and watched from start to finish the 1939 Wizard of Oz, but from cultural osmosis, I know basically everything about the movie anyway. I have watched an animated version. I guess that one was a little bit more a re-adaptation of the book. I suppose uh, it's difficult. Yeah, there's one major thing. Tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and... When I hold up this, it means I'm spoiling something. So if you don't want to hear spoilers, just wait until you see me lower it back out of frame. And that means I'm done with the spoiler. But yeah, spoiler for the original book. In the original book, the <laughs> Emerald City. The Emerald City is not actually Emerald. But when you enter... You know, before you get to the Emerald City, you're given a pair of glasses that have, like, you know, probably not real emeralds, but something that has that color. So when you look at the city, it looks like it's emerald, you know. It's one of the, you know, the, the books go, and, and movies, go into themes of don't believe everything you see in here kind of thing. You know, there are illusions that sometimes... You know, fool people, but yeah. No more spoilers for the time being, but yeah, that would be probably the biggest difference that I recall, at least. Other than that, the animated version was very similar to the, the movie, and I get why they made that different. That they made that choice for the movie. But yeah, the animated one, I must have watched that one at least a couple dozen times as a kid, and. I'm aware that there are multiple animated ones. I have no idea which one it is. It's not the one that Phelous did a, a video on. He did, did he do more than one? It's not any of the ones that Phelous did videos on, though I do recommend his videos on them. And actually, yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty decent. If you happen to find an animated version of The Wizard of Oz, there's some chance that it's a perfectly decent version. Yeah, I will not be doing a video talking about Return to Oz. I doubt I would have anything to say about it that DSD can, didn't already say, so go watch his video on it. It's longer than his usual videos, but it's worth the, the time. So... Um, I suppose, right. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. Most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. I mean, mind. I won't even know, of course. I don't have a crystal ball that allows me to watch anything as it's happening at all. That's and and certainly there's absolutely no reason for you to be checking your phone to see if that's a reference to something. So just put your phone away. Th there you go. There, exactly. Put your phone away. So I streamed this and thus didn't pay anything extra to watch it. So anything negative I say in this video, it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to the other Oz movies to what I was expecting, trailers and other marketing, other movies made by Sam Raimi. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the naked things I say in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Yeah, I'm not going to be judging the visuals in this movie. It's, you know, the, the movie is nine years old. I And I remember what movies looked like in 2013, so I'm, I'm not going to be holding it to the standards of today. You don't need to have watched any other Oz movie. There are definitely some references that, like, 
you're going to appreciate parts of this movie more if you watch the 1939 one. But other than that, yeah. You, you really don't. In, in fact, an argument could be made that, given that it's a prequel, you know, there are certain things where you know the outcome going into this movie if you watch the 1939 one. So, an argument could be made for watching this one before the 1939 one. And I guess, like, the 1939 one, by now, like, if you didn't watch it when you were a kid, and... Like, you know, adults that you trust put it on for you, then I'm not sure how many people are going to sit down and watch it and, and really get into it today. I, I wouldn't rule out doing it at some point, but I'm probably going to do a video on it. it I, I really respect, like, it was, the, the effects in it were nothing you'd seen before. You know, today they seem quaint, but at the time, very impressive. Now, that. Right. And since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, this is my first viewing. And I watched it today, right before now vlogging about it. And the reason that I'm doing a video on it now, it's, you know, it's on Disney Plus, so I don't have to pay anything extra for it. Doctor Strange 2 comes out very soon. And this is the only Sam Raimi movie that I have access to that I haven't already watched. And actually, I rewatched most of the other ones very recently. The, the Quick and the Dead and... Evil Dead 2 and 3 are the only ones that it's been a very long time since I watched. You know, the Spider-Man trilogy, his Spider-Man trilogy, the the first Evil Dead, Dark Man, and A Simple Plan, I, I watched very recently. Now, I, did I not put a spoiler? One? Okay, I'll, I'll do it now. This video will contain spoilers for the 1939 film. I am not going to be spoiling this movie until I get into the thoughts section where I will put up a permanent spoiler tag at the top of the screen. If I spoil anything else before that, then I will hold up the spoiler sign. So you might be wondering why I didn't watch this when it came out since I'm a big fan of Sam Raimi. Well, I watched the 2010 Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland movie and I was like, Look how they massacred my boy. I figured if Disney could do that to Tim Burton, they might be able to do the same to Sam Raimi. And I could not bear to see that. And then it seemed to stall his career for years, which made me even less like to watch this movie. But now he's directed Doctor Strange 2, so... You know, I'm less... You know, and, and I did... I so When I was doing research for this movie, I read... It wasn't that, like, nobody would hire him. It was basically he took a break. And, you know, he, he tried to mentor others. And, yeah, so. The plot. The con man named Oz goes, goes to the city of Oz for the prequel of Oz to the movie of Oz based on the books of Oz. And, obviously, the... the the big question is, does this movie have heart, a brain, and courage? And I suppose the answer is, to an extent, yes. Otherwise, no. So, compared to the 1939 movie, the genre has changed from fantasy musical to fantasy action adventure, but otherwise, this movie does hit a lot of familiar beats. The movie's about a normal person who lives in Kansas who's transported to the land of Oz via a tornado, when they get there, they come upon some very quirky and interesting companions that are very different to what you and I would meet in real life. And a witch tells them, in, including, like, you know, things that you wouldn't expect, like, you wouldn't normally expect a monkey to talk or fly. And you wouldn't normally expect a China doll to move and, and talk. So, yeah. 
Yeah, so very different to what you and I would meet in real life. And a witch tells them they have to kill a wicked witch. So, in some ways, this movie is darker than the 1939 movie, which has bothered some people. As far as I've heard, the books are darker than the 1939 movie. You know, and, and as Diz Deacon and I want to say, I don't... I'm afraid I don't remember his name right now, but the director of The Return to Oz, you know, points out the 1939 movie does have some really dark material. You know, there is, like, like, Dorothy straight up kills two witches by accident, sure, but she does kill them. Like, they were alive. You know, there are dead people that would be alive if she hadn't gone to Oz. Feel free to check my math. It's it's um it's because of the singing, dancing, and the fact that today the sets and special effects look quaint. They're they're not impressive anymore by today's standards. And yeah, so people forget. You know, like technically it's a children's movie, but there's also you know the the lead character is a serial witch killer. So yeah. And for sure, like, this movie has some, some stuff. I, I don't think I would personally show this movie to children. I don't think I would show this to anyone under the age of 13. But, yeah. To each their own. Now, I... I can't read your mind. I don't know how you feel about the, the following, but... Sometimes when I watch someone else's video review and I see they, you know, they've put movies behind them, you know, I'll be like, oh, wow, they did a video on that movie. I got to see that. And I'll go to their channel, do a search for the title, and turns out they didn't do a video on it. So I'm not the biggest fan of that practice. So the, the stuff I've put up is mostly stuff that I've already done a video on. The one exception is the... I forget. I, th I think it is just called Snow White. And the it's the, it's the one from 2010, I want to say. Lily Collins. Wow, I, I haven't seen her very much. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's her name, though. Lily something. I haven't done a video on it yet, but I will. It is a bit, like, it'll be several months, but I will get to it. I do intend to do a video on it. I try not to put something up there that I either haven't done a video on or that, you know, I, I don't intend to ever do a video on. Now, yeah, so, like I mentioned, you know, I added it to the schedule because, you know, in part because it's on Disney+. Plus. I will say I am glad to have watched it. I, you know, I is it is it a movie that I'm going to remember, like, I mean, I guess spe this specific movie I probably will remember. You know, in, in one week is when I go see Doctor Strange 2. I've already ordered the tickets. I got the 3D glasses out of the, the box. So, I probably will remember this movie for a little while. But if I wasn't going to watch another movie by the same director, no, I probably wouldn't. I, I would probably forget about this movie within two or three days. And that really shouldn't be the case with this kind of, you know, you have such a fantastical story and world. You really, it should be a story that just you, you remember forever. Now, I really appreciate, you know, the, the 1939 one, it's very focused on white people. This one actually does have, you know, the, the, 
yeah, in addition to white, you have black, Latinx, Asian, I think I saw some, some Jewish, Semitic people in there. And the, um, yeah, I'm just briefly going to quote some fellow critics here. This might be the first Oz movie besides The Wiz that has a lot of black people in it. That's pretty cool. The Munchkins were totally multicultural. Lots of Asians, Blacks, and Latinos. I noticed because in typical Hollywood fashion, there were zero roles for minority actors for the first hour and change. But once you get to the Munchkins, it's a regular Rainbow Coalition. And, you know, for the people who are bothered by, you know, the leads are still white and the 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 what's the word you know yeah the the protagonist isn't always exactly a hero but he is the the person most featured and he is a white guy so Now, the, there was something else that I wanted to make sure to say. Uh, right, right, the, the review I, I quoted, the reviews I quoted before were from 2013, so they weren't saying it about today's you know but by today there are at least a few more minority leads as well than in 2013 now so yeah a lot of current like action blockbuster movies you know things are planned out ahead extremely long time before they make a movie certain things are going to be in the script regardless of whether they it feels natural or not. I would definitely say there are times in this movie where you can tell, you know, okay, so obviously they felt the need to put like a chase scene here or something like attacking someone here. And I, I suppose I, I would, I didn't think that much about it while I was watching, but, you know, in the, after the credits started rolling, I did kind of think back and I was like, wow, there really were a lot of scenes where suddenly there will be some kind of special effect, multiple special effects, and there will be a chase or a creepy scene or, or something, and it's like, I'm not saying that it's bad for movies to have things like that. That's why I want, you know, if I didn't want effect shots, creepy things, and action scenes, I would stop watching Sam Raimi movies. But you can tell that it's there because basically there's an expectation that the audience doesn't have a long enough attention span. And yeah, the, the movie did an okay job justifying these things. Now, since I did not watch this in theaters, I cannot comment on the 3D, but it sounds like it was good, so I mean, if you're watching this in the future where there are, like, I mean, I guess it's possible, what's that thing, 3D Blu-ray or whatever it's called, it's possible that there's a, there is or will be a release of this movie in that format. Now, so the writing, this movie was written by Mi Mitchell Kapner and David Lindsay Abair. I, I don't know how they taught Abair to write, but moving on. Mitchell Kapner is also listed as, you know, in addition to playing, to writing the screenplay and screen story for this, he is listed as writing or having written the screenplay for the second movie 
which is listed as announced on IMDb. He wrote Into the Blue to the Reef and Days of Wrath, the screenplay, which I haven't seen, so I can't comment on those. But he also wrote the whole nine yards and the characters and story for the whole ten yards, as well as Romeo Must Die, which I guess is a story about someone who's really fed up with reading Romeo and Juliet in class. I mean, they're okay. I, I'm the, the nine yards and ten yards were not really my kinds of movies, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna criticize them by saying, oh, you know, here's all the ways that they're not my kind of movie. They're just not my kind of movie. Romeo Must Die is the kind of thing that I could really get into. I remember it being fine, like nothing groundbreaking, but it held my attention, you know. And David Lindsay Abair, I have to admit, I haven't watched, yeah, I haven't watched a single other thing that he's written, but I, there's a, uh, let's see, a bunch of animation. He has, he has nine credits total. One of them is only announced. He wrote the Poltergeist remake, which... It's possible I'll watch that at some point. The original Poltergeist is a masterpiece. For what it is. It's not like the best movie ever made. But boy does it work on its own terms. And it doesn't aim low either. And I suppose... Yeah, I, I think the they did a perfectly fine job writing this one. Now, quoting some fellow critics, the movie is limited because it has to fit with the original movie, so the characters have to be close to that. The worst part of this movie is the story. It leaves you waiting for some kind of clever and unexpected plot twist, a little divulgence of characters' motivations, or even just some depth for the main focal point points of the story. It's also somewhat obnoxious that this film takes elements of the original film that should have been left alone because the original film portrays Dorothy's entire journey as a dream. In the end, such as transferring characters of the real world into characters of the land of Oz, without saying too much, I can tell you that this film is stuck somewhere between being a fun and family-friendly revitalization of the original story and being a series and intriguing fantasy film for a wide-going audience, wide movie-going audience. And the formula just doesn't work. For what? does not work. Look no further than the script, which is not very well put together. Yes, it is a kid's film, but kids are a lot more sophisticated than some of the dialogue here. Some of the kids in the audience I was with moaned a bit while hearing it. Moreover, yes, it is a prequel to a story that many people know, so there should not be any real surprises, but that is no excuse to be lazy with the script, and the script writing is lazy here. Yeah, there there is definitely some truth to those criticisms. The so plot twists. I mean, I don't think there are too many of them. I don't think there are too few of them. I would definitely say that a few of them are a tad too easy to figure out for the viewer. Which, you know, considering that it is supposed to be a movie that children can follow, you know, you can you can understand why there might be some twists that children, you know, that adults could guess if they're supposed to be easy enough to understand for children. I, I'm not sure I would say any of the twists are particularly good. Like, the... It's not one of those movies where, you know, once you learn the twist, it completely falls apart. But, yeah, the, the twists... No, I... 
I'm not sure I would say any of them are particularly good. And again, part of it definitely is that the movie has to, you know, one way or the other. It has to show, you know, the, the movie starts with things being one certain way. And over the course of the movie, some things will change that make the movie closer to the way that things are at the start of the 1939 movie. And this both means that they're easier to figure out because you know what the, you know, it's, it's kind of like, like, if you're, if you're if you've got like a, a puzzle a jigsaw puzzle if you look at the at the cover of the box that it came in you're gonna know what it ends up looking like rather than if you just like if, if you get the pieces you didn't you never looked at the cover and you just put the pieces together you know so that's one thing but just also yeah, there's some there's some very frustrating writing when it comes to the twists, which I'll get more into in the spoiler sections. So yeah, this was directed by Sam Raimi, who currently has 19 credits as a movie director. And I suppose I will just briefly say that the let's see. right yeah one I don't know why music videos are under movie instead of under short but whatever but yeah he directed the Iggy Pop music video for Cold Metal I figured why not you know it's it's just a few minutes how you know I Iggy Pop I don't it doesn't ring a bell like Iggy Pop, did he play, did he play a bad guy in one of the first two Crow movies, maybe? I, whatever, you know, I can, I can live with a couple of minutes of that, you know, whatever. It's a really good music video, like, the, yeah, I don't, I don't think Sam Raimi is capable of directing something that's just legitimately boring, but, you know, I haven't watched It's Murder, I haven't watched Crime Wave, and I haven't watched For Love of the Game. So it's possible that one of those is just terrible. Like, apparently, Crime Wave was negatively received. And he, you know, he was like, mea culpa, I'll do better next time. That's right. He actually did direct something before The Evil Dead. I, yeah. I, and something that was feature length at that. I would not have guessed anyway he also directed 16 shorts he has three tv directing credits one video directing credit and he helped develop the xena warrior princess tv show i think he also helped do the hercules show but i haven't watched all of that one xena i have watched all of them i I'm not sure exactly how much I watched of Hercules. I liked it, you know. Is it, it? It is the the show that it wants to be and claims to be. Now, the yeah, this this movie was a passion project for Sam Raimi and some of the cast, and it does show. You know you. Uh, Parts of it could definitely be better than they are, but it doesn't feel like it was just a paycheck or that just like, you know, this big corporation just sucked all the creative juice out of the man, you know. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not 100% certain how Tim Burton's ended up so boring because that was only three years before this one. You know, the, the is Alice in Wonderland movie, but yeah, that one. Anyway, moving on. 
so yeah, quoting fellow critic, despite how the poster and other advertised materials marketing make it look, this is very different from the Tim Burton 2010 Alice in Wonderland movie, thankfully. That one looks too dark for what it's about. This one looks as bright and colorful as it should. And 100% agreed. Like, it is, like, the colors pop. It is very vivid. And I really appreciated that. And it's not like Sam Raimi never does dark and desaturated, you know. But he's never really been afraid to embrace bright colors. You know, his... Like, before his first Spider-Man movie, it looked like it might be a while before we were going to get another superhero movie that went with the costumes that we saw in the in the comics and actually had bright colors instead of desaturated ones after the train wreck that was Batman and Robin, you know. After that movie, we get X-Men movies... I, yeah, we got one X Men movie before the before the first Spider Spider Man movie we got, where they're just wearing black leather and there's very little color and fun in the movie, which I I still really love that movie, that first one, the first two, and some of the others. But yeah, the yeah the man is not ashamed of putting out a movie that is like bright and, and colorful. Now, another fellow critic said, The movie isn't weird enough to be an Oz movie, let alone a Sam Raimi movie. That is something that I I can't argue with. That is 100% true. You know, the, the, the other Oz movies, the, yeah, the 1939 one and Return to Oz, both have such weird concepts that just really, like, yeah, really, really memorable. And this movie really feels like it is... You know, I, I mentioned that it's not entirely without courage, but to an extent, it's not the most courageous. And it really, it definitely feels like they were scared that they were gonna lose money on it if they took a lot of risks. And at the end of the day, like, you can... You don't have to like the 1939 movie... You gotta admit, there's some weird stuff in there that, like, if the movie was made today, yeah, you just wouldn't have, you know, you, you can just look at the, the, huh? Com comparing this to the 1939 one, you know, the, the, we, we do in both have something that in the real world is an inanimate object moving and talking you know we in both in in yeah the talking scarecrow in 1939 and in this you have a china doll girl and you know a a talking flying monkey it's not nothing you know i do appreciate that like the, the people that he spends the most time with are not just, like, completely normal-looking people. Uh, people who talk completely normally and, and stuff like that. But it definitely could stand to be a lot weirder, yeah. And as a Sam Raimi movie, yeah. It's, it's... If I didn't know for a fact that he directed this, I think I would probably guess that he, like, did the cinematography as a favor or something, but didn't direct the movie. Because his, like, his fingerprints are all over the camera work. Which is also some, I, I don't remember for sure, but I feel like I remember the 2010 Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland movie being kind of visually meh and bland compared to his other movies, which he's also a very visual director, you know? Yeah, like, this movie, you can really tell that it was filmed by Sam Raimi. He, his camera work 
I, I don't know anyone who has these. I, there are other visually impressive directors, but I don't know anybody else whose camera really moves the way Sam Raimi's does. So, quoting some Wikipedia, Justin Chang of Variety had a mixed reaction. Writing the film gets some mileage out of its game performances, luscious production design, and un the unfettered enthusiasm director Sam Raimi brings to a thin, simplistic origin story. Art director Robert Stromberg, who worked on Avatar and Alice in Wonderland, drew inspiration from the films of Frank Capra and James Wong Howe to achieve the art deco design he envisioned for the art for the emerald city stromberg contrasted the colorful tonal qualities of oz with the restrained appearance of alice affirming that although both films explore similar fantasy worlds the overall atmosphere and landscape of each are completely different stromberg in 2011 stromberg and his team visited the walt disney archives during the pre-production phase to reference production art from disney's animated films such as pinocchio bambi fantasy Fantasia, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Alice in Wonderland, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, drawing from designs and textures in order to give certain settings of the film an affectionate nod to the Disney style. That definitely shows. I would definitely say you can you get a real sense of that, yeah. Continuing on, costume designer Gary Jones focused an, on authenticity with his wardrobe designs. We started by doing a lot of research and having ideas of the ways costumes should look in order to be historically accurate, but as we went on, we really began creating a whole new world. My first instinct was the there are such iconic images in the Wizard of Oz movie, it would be wrong for us to recreate the old brick road of the Emerald City in a different way. We had to go 180 degrees in the other direction, we're just going to make our own Oz. Which is what Sam Raimi said on recreating the Land of Oz under legalities. Although the film is a spirited prequel to the 1939 Metro Golden Meyer film The Wizard of Oz, it was not allowed legally to be considered as such. The filmmakers had to toe a fine line between calling the film to mind but not infringing upon it. To that end, Disney had a copyright expert on set to ensure no infringement occurred. The production team worked under the constraint of abiding by the stipulations set forth, forth by Warner Brothers, the legal owner of the rights, to iconic elements of the 1939 film via its Turner Entertainment sister company, which purchased the MGM Film Library in 1986, including the ruby slippers worn by Julie Garland. Therefore, Disney was unable to use them, nor any original character likenesses from the 1939 film. This extended to the green of the Wicked Witch's skin, for which Disney used what its legal department referred to, considered a sufficiently different shade, dubbed Theo. And never mind. Yeah, additionally, the studio could not use the signature mole, chin mole of Margaret Hamilton's portrayal of the Witch of the West, nor could they employ the Yellow Brick Road's swirl design for Munchkin Land. The expert also ensured that the Emerald City was not too close in appearance to the original Emerald City in the 1939 film. While Warner and Disney did not engage in a copyright battle, they did file rival trademarks. In October 2012, Disney filed a trademark on Oz the Great and Powerful, while one week later, Warner filed its own trademarks for the Great and Powerful Oz. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office suspended Warner's attempt at a trademark because Disney had filed basically the same a week earlier. And in addition to legal issues, the film was also faced with delays when several cast members went on hiatus due to unrelated commitments and circumstances. Let's see. Yeah, Rachel Weiss left halfway through the shoot to film her entire role in The Boring Legacy. Michelle Williams was required to promote the release of My Week with Marilyn, and Franco's father died during production. Roth compared the task of managing overlapping schedules to being an air traffic controller. And yeah, so the the green skin makeup and prosthetics were supervised by Greg Nicotero, talented guy, demanded four hours to apply, another hour to remove. And the actress taking nearly two months to fully recover from the subsequent removal of the makeup from her skin. Yeah, and the
I'm trying to think of if there are times in the movie where you can tell about these, you know, these overlapping schedules. I'm not sure I offhand can think of any. So, quoting some fellow critics, the movie is visually stunning. Very true. The directing is probably the weakest link in this movie, but the story and actors more than make up for this. The character development is amazing and shows exactly why things were the way they are in The Wizard of Oz. Simply say to Oz, the great and powerful is truly a perfect prequel. I love Sam Raimi, the man, and his inventive work with camera are what made me want to get into filmmaking in the first place. So to see him handling big projects like this and Spider-Man was a joy for me to see. Oz the Great and Powerful is a CGI heavy film that demands a creative eye behind the lens. After his work on big budget films like Spider-Man, it seemed like an easy choice for Raimi to be the one behind Oz and for the most part it works. The film's shortcomings keep it from being really magical and memorable like the original from 99. But Oz has enough whimsy to keep the kids entertained and the adults smiling. Despite the fakeness of some of the scenes, not all, Raimi does a decent job not letting the effects overpower the film. Raimi steers the film in the right direction. Sam Raimi's prequel to L. Frank Baum's series of children's books plays greatly into Raimi's strengths as a director. A strong imaginary world that is covered in light and darkness and characters that inhabit that world with a quirky field of childhood imagination. Raimi literally puts his heart and soul into this production, and it shows, giving a festival of the senses with the viewer's imagination. While Raimi is working over time to make all this work, weak script and bad casting are two very important key roles to set him back. I enjoyed this Raimi joint just fine. It's exciting to see directors trying new things. It, is it his best? No, but it's certainly an entertaining and unique take. If I had to guess why Raimi chose this over Pirates of the Caribbean sequel, which he would have been a great match for. He could have been that franchise's Justin Lin, amping up the best aspects of what had come before. I would guess it's because he probably loves The Wizard of Oz, because it's one of the greatest achievements in Hollywood cinema. The chance to play with those technical toys, but in a way where he got to make it his own, must have been an irresistible opportunity. Now, the opening... Yeah, so the, the um, yeah, the very first shot of the movie has it's it's this long take as the camera passes several different attractions at the carnival where Oz works. And as Wikipedia notes, the film's opening sequence is presented in black and white. When Oscar is caught up in the tornado, the audio switches from Mon mon oral to stereo and eventually surround sound. The film shifts to full color when Oscar arrives in Oz. Additionally, the aspect ratio gradually widens from 4-3 Academy ratio to 235-1 widescreen. And it works really well. And I've I've seen some say, well, it wasn't you know, the fact that it looked the way it did in the original movie wasn't a stylistic choice that was just you know the way it had to look back then well yeah but this movie can do an homage to that and it wants to and it did and your mileage may vary I personally thought it worked really well and the opening titles so IMDb's crazy credits says that they are seen in a 1930s Nickelodeon. I guess that is what that's called. But yeah, it's like this kind of puppet theater kind of thing. Like little little figures will be moved in, in front of the camera lens and then moved and then back out and replaced with something else. And just, yeah, there's, there's no good reason for a movie like this to have boring credits. And it doesn't. So... I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. I will say it fits with what came before. I guess the ending is fine. It's not like I'm not over the moon about it, but it could have been a lot worse. It doesn't rely on Deus Ex Machina. 
there is some convenient writing, but you know, it's not the first convenient writing in the movie, so it kind of fits. Quoting some fellow critics, given that assumption, this could have been a really good movie, but just didn't get there for me. The last third of the film started to get very good, but the foundation in the first two thirds was so weak in acting and writing that I almost didn't care. I think I was most disappointed in Franco, especially the scenes early on when the girl asks him. Generally, it was set up well enough to be a very good moment. But for me, his response to that moment looked like nothing more than an actor on a stage. That took me completely out of the movie, stuck me back in a theater. Same effect when his girlfriend, who obviously cares for him, was telling him another man asked her to marry him. A juicy moment, well set up, and act acted waiting to be expanded upon. And Franco goes on this wooden delivery of lines while staring heavily past the camera. Again stuck me back in a movie theater seat. Parallels to those characters later in the movie suffer the same way. Williams did a nice job, but each moment... Mm, yeah. All this to say, the most prominent thing that kept running through my mind the entire movie was, and I know this, he's been used to death in Pirates, but Oz needed to be played by Johnny Depp. I think it could have been so much better with him in that role. His goofiness would have been perfect the con man magician and the scenes in Entering Oz, but I would have loved to have seen what he would have done with those two moments that were just teed up for high drama that Franco whiffed on. Now the ending titles leave you in the same emotion as the ending causes, thus following up on the ending, and let's see, so yeah, I I'm not certain if I've made it clear yet, so I'll just say it completely clearly now. I have not read any of the books, as far as I recall. If if I have, I must have been a child when I last did and remember absolutely nothing. Nor have other people read them to me. So, moving on to the characters. So... James Franco plays Oscar Zoroaster Fadrick Isaac Norman Hinkle Emmanuel Ambrose Diggs, commonly known as Oz, because he doesn't like when people point out that technically his initials spell Oz Pinhead. A philandering con artist, a stage magician, and a barnstormer who was part of a traveling circus in the Midwest. He's whisked in a hot air balloon by a tornado to the land of Oz, where he's believed to be a wizard destined to bring peace to the land, forcing him to overcome his dubious ethics to convince his peers he is the hero needed by the people of Oz. So according to Wikipedia, Roth initially sought Robert Downey Jr. for the title role of the wizard. Sam Raimi was hired to direct in 2010 from a short list including Sam Mendes and Anne Shankman, in January 2011, Ra Downey declined the role, and it was offered to Johnny Depp, who had previously collaborated with the studio in Pirates of the Caribbean. Alice in Wonderland, Depp liked the role, but was already committed to the Lone Ranger. In February, James Frango, and some, I've heard at least one critic say, you can tell he was the third choice because he doesn't do a very good job. You know, he didn't really want to, he, he, he felt like they just, they only went to him because... They had, they didn't have any other choices. Accepted seven million dollars to start in the film five months before filming was scheduled to begin. Franco and Raimi had previously worked together on the Spider-Man trilogy, which Franco played Peter Parker's best friend Harry Osborn. Franco received training for the role from magician Lance Burton. Disney's history with Oz after the success of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves in 1937. Walt Disney planned to produce an animated film based on the first of Frank L. Frank Baum's Oz books. However, however, Roy O. Disney, the chairman of Walt Disney Productions, was informed by Baum's estate that they had sold the rights to the first book to Samuel Goldwyn, who resold it to Louis B. Meyer in 1938. Ironically, the film was approved due to the success of Snow White. The project was then developed by Metro Goldwyn Meyer into the well-known musical adaptation, which was released the following year. 
1954, when the rights to Bob's remaining 13 Oz books were made available, Walt Disney Productions acquired them for use in Disney's television series, Disneyland, which led to the live-action film The Rain Rainbow Road to Oz, which was abandoned and never completed. Disney's history with the Oz series continued with the 1985 film Return to Oz, which performed poorly, both critically and commercially, but has developed a cult following since its release by fans of the books who considered a more faithful adaptation to the Oz books than the 1939 classic. After Return to Oz, Disney lost the film rights to the Oz books, and they subsequently refer reverted to the public domain. In 2005, Disney produced the television series The Muppets Wizard of Oz, which aired on its network, ABC. Upon the release of Wicked, screenwriter Michael Kepner felt he had missed his opportunity to explore the origins of the Wizard of Oz character. In 2009, he met with producer Joe Roth, who turned down his current pitches, asked if he had any other ideas. Kepner, who had been reading the Oz series to his children, outlined the plots of the books. Roth stopped him on the sixth book, The Emerald City of Oz, which had some of the wizard's backstory. Roth said, during the years that I spent running Walt Disney Studios, I learned about how hard it was to find a fairy tale with a good, strong male protagonist. You've got your Sleeping Beauties, your Cinderella's, and your Alice's. But a fairy tale with a male protagonist is very hard to come by. But with the origin story of the Wizard of Oz, here was a fairy tale story with an actual male protagonist, which is why I knew this was an idea for a movie that was genuinely worth pursuing. First and foremost, there are countless stories that aren't fairy tales with a male protagonist. But also, tons of fairy tales do have male protagonists. Very frequently, they'll be about a regular man doing better than men presumed to be excellent through cleverness or application of a skill sometimes undervalued. So I don't know why, how you're, like, the whole trope of getting, you know, marrying the princess and becoming the king, like, there are tons of fairy tales that are, you know, about a male lead who impresses and marries the princess and becomes the king. Now, so, yeah, so quoting some fellow critic, James Franco's con artist doesn't come across as an a-hole, as charming, or desperate. For some critics, it still worked, but for many, it didn't. In most of the books, the lead is a woman or a girl. This is also true of most adaptations. This is one of the only ones where the lead is male. I've seen James Franco give great acting performances, but he does not do that here. You never actually forget that you're looking at James Franco. He doesn't disappear into the role at all. It's James Franco's shoulders it has to rest on. He's the type of actor that comes off as not really caring. It works in some films, like Panic Film Express, and he does manage to turn in some truly great performances. Look at 127 days or freaks. Isn't it hours? Whatever. Freaks and geeks for that. Unfortunately, I don't know if he has enough charisma and power to command a film like this. Some, it looked like he was in the role. Other times it felt like he couldn't care. Maybe it's his acting style, I can't really put my finger on it, but clearly Rainey sees something in him because he has worked with them previously on the Spider-Man films. What makes the problems with the batch with the script jump out? Here's some of the casting, which is just bad. A good actor is able to make a bad script work somehow for the character. A bad actor only magnifies the script's problems and makes their character look worse. Unfortunately, we have two actors completely wrong with their roles here. It only makes this movie even and a bigger chore to sit through for cinematic offense is the main character Oscar Diggs who is not only the weakest character in the film but as an actor who is just not believable in the role James Franco can be a decent actor when he tries he can be infuriatingly bad when he just stands there and not care about his performance which he does here in this film the character of Oscar Diggs is supposed to be the anchor of this film However, thanks to Franco's lazy performance and the weakness of the script, Oscar comes across more as a sleazy opportunist than a man conflicted with his inner self. We cannot rule for him at all. The character is a wasted opportunity, and 
really does not add to the story, and thanks to Franco's inability to show sincerity with his role, we really do not care at all about poor Oscar or his problems. Believe it or not, he's kind of like Ash with all kinds of Army of Darkness parallels. He falls from the sky, they think he's the chosen one. He's in way over his head, but is willing to lie to take in unearned power and glory. If only Johnny Depp had taken this role, taken it seriously, instead of just mugging at the camera like he does for every single Tim Burton movie he has been in lately. Stick Franco in that Alice in Wonderland movie instead. Who cares? It's stupid and annoying, and he couldn't ruin it. I think Franco would probably do a better job there anyway. He never seems to take his role seriously and always seems to be goofing off, which might add a little levity and charm to the Mad Hatter character. Depp plays him like we're supposed to see some hidden depths of the goofiness, and it is just depressing. Unfortunately, I fear that Depp would have just dragged down this production in a similar way that he does everything since the original Pirates of the Caribbean. He seems hopelessly stuck in one mode of acting. Maybe Raimi could have snapped him out of it, Raimi does seem like a really good actress-director. He gets some goofy stuff out of his actors, like women running at the camera screaming, but it is obviously on purpose to fit the scene. I doubt he would tolerate Depp's Willy Wonka BS. Now, Oscar is introduced wearing magician's getup and stepping out from behind the curtain, similar to the one he's seen hiding behind in the original movie. So that was a nice little bit of, like, yeah, you know, immediately, you know, okay, this is, this really is that guy. And Mila Kunis plays Theodora, a naive good witch who has the land of Oz's best interests at heart. She believes that Oscar is the wizard prophecy to defeat the evil witch from the dark forest and develops an attraction to Oscar and let's see. yeah she actually in in an early scene she says that she she isn't on anybody's side she just wants peace and yeah Multiple critics have said her performance just isn't as strong as the others. While I am a straight male reviewing this movie, I'm not going to be one of the straight male reviewers of this movie who talk about if the immensely talented actresses Michelle Williams and Rachel Weisz are still attractive even though this was years after they were first deemed attractive. Given their immense talent, I really feel like that's what we should focus on. Yeah, Rachel Weisz plays Evanora the protector of the Emerald City, and I'm not going to give away, there's there's a twist surrounding the, but she gives a really strong performance. And according to IMDb Trivia, Hilary Swank and Michelle Williams were director Sam Raimi's first choices for the role of Evanora. Rachel Weisz got the script through her agent, Loved the role, but neither studio or Raimi imagined her for the part. Weiss auditioned and had a two-hour conversation with Raimi, and later she was cast as Evanora, and Williams was cast as another character. And I suppose, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I, she also gives a really great performance, and I'm not going to give any detail. So, Zach Braff is the voice of Finley, a winged monkey who pledges an irre irre irrevocable life debt to Oscar, believing him to be the prophesied wizard for saving him. He quickly regrets his decision when Oscar reveals he's not a wizard, but nonetheless helps him out. And Braff also plays Frank, Oscar's long-suffering yet loyal assistant in Kansas. I've been over Zach Braff for quite some years now. Like, I... I'm not going to go into a rant about Scrubs because at the end of the day, that show was never made for me. At first I thought it was because we share an absurd sense of humor 
But at the end of the day, I have to admit the show, some of the key creative decisions mean that it was not for me. For the people that it is for, it seems to really, like for at least a number of the seasons, they they really loved what the show did. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to criticize the show for not being for me. That I, I really don't like when other reviewers do that. But... Zach Braff, like his comedy, he can be very extra. He can be annoying and like hyper and and overly goofy, overly like what's the word? Like there's a there's there's a quality to him where he like this this sort of sincere but yeah I, I he's not really my kind of you know but I gotta admit I really liked him a lot here I thought he you know he got multiple big laughs from me I I don't think there was really any what's the word yeah, like the the. I'm I'm not sure there were very many laughs, an intended laughs, that didn't work for me of of his. And Bill Cobb's plays the master tinker. The leader of the tinkers, makes sense. He doesn't get an awful lot to do, but. I'm never going to turn down seeing Bill Cobbs in a movie. Joey King performs the voice of China Girl, a young living China doll from a specific part of Oz where everything, including its inhabitants, is made of China. And... Yeah, China Girl and Oscar become friends, and I'm not going to give away exactly what. I'm I'm just going to say that Joey King also plays a live action character, and I haven't seen her in that many things, but I did. I did know before watching this that she she would appear in things after this movie that where she like did really great acting, you know, both the both with her voice and with her face. And yeah, I was very impressed she did that already in this one. You know, she wasn't you know, she wasn't even an adult yet. And she she gives a really heartfelt performance. The the yeah she her character really got to me. Her characters, her performances of the characters really got to me. And let's see. Yeah, so the the Bruce Campbell is credited as Winky Gatekeeper. Yeah, just keep your Winky behind the gate. There are children watching. You know, once again, never going to complain about seeing Bruce Campbell in a movie, especially in a Sam Raimi movie. It helps maintain the illusion. And I guess that is okay. 
Yeah, I'm just real quick. Yeah. Raimi, who often casts friends and actors regular actor regulars in cameo roles, cast his brother Ted as a small town skeptic. Two of his former teachers, named Moll and Jim Bird, as well as Dan Hicks, Maris Serafino, and his daughter Emma. As Emerald City Townspeople and the three actresses from his 1981 directorial debut, The Old Dead, Ellen Sandweiss, Betsy Baker, and Teresa Tilly, as well as his sons, Dashiell and Oliver, respectively as Quadling Townspeople. Gene Jones portrays a Wild West Barker, Martin Kleppa portrays a Munchkin Rebel. John Paxton, R.I.P., who previously worked with Raimi in the Spider-Man trilogy. And Drag Me to Hell, oh, that's right, he is in that, yeah. Makes a posthumous appearance as an elder tinker in his final film role before his death in November 2011, while the great-grandson of Burt Lair also portrays a tinker. Now, I... Yes, so the... According to IMDb Trivia, Olivia Wilde, Amy Adams, Blake Lively, Kate Beckinsale, Kira Knightley, Rebecca Hall, and Kristen Stewart were considered for the roles of the witches. I have to admit, I didn't realize that Kristen Stewart at that time was considered... Like, wasn't that back when people still thought that her uh, her character Bella in the Twilight movies, that, like, that was her fault rather than just her doing what the director told and, and what the script said? Like, I've only seen clips of those movies, but yeah, I agree. She's, she's annoying. You know, the, the blinking and fidgeting and stammering and all that. But that's the character. That's not the actress. You know, yes, she, at least back then, was also somewhat awkward in, like, interviews and such. But that's not the same. She, she was a great actress, even... <sighs> You know, I, I don't think anybody disputes that she's a great actress today. And just if if they do, they haven't seen anything since the Twilight movies. But you know, in 2012, she was she played Snow White in a Snow White and the Huntsman movie. If you, in a Snow White movie called Snow White and the Huntsman, and she does a great job. Like compare her performance in that. Her performance is Bella. And you will see that she is capable of playing an, a, an, a character that is completely different. She doesn't stammer. She doesn't, you know, yeah, and all, all these, like, she's, she's a much more confident person. So, so yeah, the, the... I was I was a little surprised to to read that she was considered for that when they made this, you know, 2010, 2011, but yeah, good good on them. Given that the IMDb trivia doesn't say which which I had to. These various actresses were being suggested to play, it's hard for me to say for sure. I mean, I'm not, I've, I've barely seen Blake Lively in anything. She was the, I believe she was in Green Lantern as the, the girlfriend character. I'm not sure I've seen her in anything else. The rest of them, including Kristen Stewart, could definitely have done a great job as the, some, some of the witch characters in this movie. And yeah, it's, it's interesting to imagine. But I do think that the casting of Michelle Williams and Rachel Weiss is strong. It is too bad about Mila Kunis. I, I get it. I mean, she is... There are movies where I thought that she was great. Chief among them almost definitely being 
black swan you know she legitimately does give a very compelling performance in that movie the the you know the the confidence she exudes she is completely unashamed of her sexuality which stands in very stark contrast to Natalie Portman's character you know the the yeah excellent job you know it's it's yeah i'm i'm sure that she she probably did realize like some people were going to watch the movie and think that that's just her that she's that way in real life and they would judge her for it and she, despite that she took the role and she did a great job it you know in general it's a great movie yeah i i wish i could say that her performance in this is as compelling as it is in that i mean part of it is just that she's miscast the the there are things that her character does and there, there are things that she's asked to do as an actress that she at least at the time was not able to do convincingly and it's yeah it's it's too bad i i i don't like criticizing someone who like she seems like legitimately nice good person in real life she is talented and she did try it doesn't feel like she just didn't care it's just that she's miscast and i i wish they had realized before they started making the movie that it should be someone else but yeah and yeah quoting fellow critics i think the actors are trying but the performances are just bad it's like he went back to getting performances of actors like in the evil dead movies and Spider-Man movies instead of a simple plan and the gift. To an extent, I agree with that. I'm not sure that this movie, like, I'm not sure it would have worked well if the performances were like a simple plan. I, I have to admit, I don't remember the gift that much, but a simple plan, like very serious, very subtle, very down-to-earth performances. The the people talk and look the way real people do, and. I don't think that would have worked completely for something like this. The supporting cast also performs pretty well, sometimes capturing that original Wizard of Oz magic. Going into this film with high expectations, but dialogue and acting is going to leave you very disappointed. Two of the most featured roles of the film, Oz played by James Franco and Theodora played by Mila Kunis, are surprisingly and inexcusably portrayed very poorly. Franco's Oz is written to be about how you would expect him to be, complete with charm, wit, and deceit. However, the depth that you would expect to come with such an anticipated resurgence of character is missing. And you can tell that Franco is having trouble buying into the role himself. The character quickly becomes stale at about 45 minutes in and doesn't ever fully recover. Kunis feels the same, bored and devoid of passion for the lackluster lines given to her. Her character also has an issue with development and is rushed so quickly that the audience doesn't have the opportunity to invest in her. The performances aren't the worst thing you'll ever see, but the lifeless script and awkward dialogue makes it hard to stay focused. Even with a great script, though, I feel as though Franco and Kunis weren't the best choices for their respective roles. So, yeah, I've, as I've already said, I don't completely agree with... I, I don't think that Kunis feels bored and devoid of passion, but... I do think she's miscast. I felt that Mila Kunis came across as a bit flat. Her character arc seems too forced, and we don't really get to see much progression. I didn't mind James Franco, to be completely honest. He was appropriately sleazy when needed to be, charming in a goofy way when needed. I think he could have invested his character with a bit more depth, but it never really turned me off to his character at all. Superficiality is a huge part of his character, and I thought it worked overall. The side characters were a delight, with some of the best comedic lines coming from Oz's traveling companions, and of course Rachel Weiss steals the show with a delicious performance. I would definitely say, like, the, you know, China Girl and Finley, both, yeah, they, they have some really great lines.
mildly entertaining look at the origins of the characters from The Wizard of Oz has everything down pat from great visuals to imaginative set pieces. This film has everything. It does not however, have, however, a single interesting character outside of the film's main villain. Not to mention the fact that its script is as thin as a sheet of paper. The plot reeks of Star Wars prequel, but without the lightsabers. Its main hero is Oscar Diggs, played by James Franco, is not interesting at all and does not help matters that Franco is miscast. And while Oscar is supposed to be a bit of a con man with heart, Franco comes across more as a degenerate deviant with his performance. While Franco is sputtering out of control performance-wise, it falls on his co-stars to pick up the slack. One of them is Rachel Weisz. And in my mind, the best thing about this film while most of the things in this film are mostly kid stuff. And Weiss's performance elevates this film past most of its problems. Her showmanship with the material is greatly appreciated, especially when after a while you are getting quite annoyed with most of the characters in this movie, especially the computer-generated ones. Another actor who picks up Frank of Slack is Michelle Williams, the only actor in the film who can hold the screen with Weiss performance wise. The movie could have worked much better if it just had Weiss and Williams as the leads, but unfortunately it's not. You have to suffer through Franco trying to be charming in a squirmy way, kind of way, and suffer through probably the movie's worst offense, which is the character of Theodore, played by Mila Kunis, who redefines the word miscast. Theodore is supposed to be innocent. Unfortunately, Mila comes across as interesting as a block of wood in this film. And her character ends up being more funny in a very bad sort of way. It does not help matters that Mila looks as disinterested in her character as the audience is, and a better actor with more range could have brought more to it. I watched it with my better half, and she unfortunately did not like it, citing the acting as the main cause. I, of course, was giggling with delight my way through it precisely of what she referred to as intentionally bad acting. Now, the dialogue. There are 38 entries in the MDB quote section. Most of them are good. I quoted earlier in this video a critic as saying that the dialogue was a bit obvious and didn't really respect the intelligence of kids there is definitely some some truth to that but there are also some good like kind of like characters will sometimes say things that really yeah that that are very revealing that show who they are show how they react to certain things So on the cinematography, it was handled by DP Peter Deming, who has 46 movie credits, including The New Mutants, The Cabin in the Woods, Scream 4, Drag Me to Hell, Austin Powers and Goldmember, From Hell, Mulholland Drive, Scream 3, Screen 2, Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery, Lost Highway, Joe's Apartment, and Evil Dead 2. So, yeah, he has shot other things for Sam Raimi, and he has shot other, like, fantastical kind of you know, with, with Cabin in the Woods and Drag Me to Hell. And... Yeah, the... He tends to keep it easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. And the movie does not have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. There are a number of sequences where characters are traveling from one place to another Sometimes they walk, sometimes they run, sometimes they fly. The visuals are very impressive. We get some nice long shots. 
and these are some of the parts of the movie that work the best. You know, they're not necessarily deep, but they're visually appealing, and they do get across the the wonder of this world. Now, the editing was handled by Bob Morawski, who has edited... He has 26 movie editing credits, including World War III, which has been announced. I mean, I guess they want to get the movie out before it actually happens. But yeah, other than this, he, yeah, he edited Drag Me to Hell, Raimi's Spider-Man Trilogy, The Gift, and Army of Darkness. So, the, yeah, he's edited other things for Raimi, and, under, you know, he's, he's very familiar with Raimi's style, and... In, yeah, in addition to those, he also edited Poltergeist, so he has edited, which he also edited before Oz the Green. Nope, never mind. Just caught that. He That was afterwards. But yeah, he's, after this, he was hired for editing other of these kind of out there concept things, you know, so that is the kind of thing he's, he's, he excels at. And, yeah, like, the the editing does a lot to control, you know, some scenes are creepy and scary. Some scenes are this kind of, like, one, this sense of wonder. Some scenes are funny. Some scenes are emotional. The editing plays a really big part in that. And the, the... Yeah, the, the there. When a scene like that doesn't work, it's never because of the editing that it doesn't. In in this movie, so the special effects, there's definitely like some. You know, they're not all equally good, but the. Yeah, I mean, some of the effects are practical, and the movie's better for it. There's just more weight to practical on-set effects that CGI, certainly at the time, couldn't replicate, and to this day has trouble replicating. And, yeah, now, now that the special effects can do so much more, you know, in 2013, when special effects could do so much more than 1939, we get more detailed and creative uses of some of the magic that we see used in the original, including the bubble transportation, the broom flying, firing fireballs from hands, flying monkeys, poppy fields. You know, so, yeah. It's not a surprise that they did that with a movie made so long after when effects had improved so much. But I think they do a good job. Of it. I, I'm not sure I would say that any of it was really... I'm not sure I would say any effect scene goes on for too long. It which easily could have ended up happening. But, like, every single time, like, it would go on for a while. And then it would come to a natural conclusion. And we'd get a scene of real people, live-action actors, talking to each other. And, like making eye contact, doing real people stuff. You know, this is one of the reasons I I would personally I see myself rewatching this movie sooner than one of the Star Wars prequels where just George Lucas's I love some of the movies he's made. I do. I still think that the original 1977 Star Wars is a masterpiece. But he is not that good at directing actors. And that really comes across in the prequels. And yeah, like Sam Raimi, like him or hate him, he tends to get 
the performance from an actor that he wants to get from the actor. You know, I, I do think that Mila Kunis is definitely miscast. James Franco is almost definitely also miscast. Uh, although, I guess it's possible that he just didn't completely understand the assignment. I, I don't particularly like him in the the Spider-Man films, but he plays the character the way that Sam Raimi wants. I'm almost 100% certain of that. So, and, and there are times where he comes across as intense and, and dark. So, yeah. The, the... Yeah, I, th I think they did a good job with, you know, I, I already mentioned these long takes of, you know, characters moving, you know, with, with a lot of visual effects. And, like, if they wanted, they could have had the whole movie, you know, they, they didn't have to have human moments in, once again, like we see in the Star Wars prequels, but they did. You know, Sam Raimi realized it doesn't matter how good the effects are, every so often we gotta just give the audience something that they can latch on to. Human actors saying lines and making eye contact and so you know, yeah. So quoting some fellow critics, some of the time you can definitely tell that you're looking at CG and it puts you out of it. Intrigue me with their deliberately over the top fakery, like a CGI version of the charmingly low budget projection stuff in Army of Darkness. I'd probably dislike that from any other director, but I trust Sam and I know where he's coming from. So, quoting some Wikipedia, compare the film, the film scale with the Star Wars prequel trilogy, adding, in a real sense, Oz the Great and Powerful has certain kinship with George Lucas' Star Wars prequels in the way it presents a beautiful but borderline sterile digital update of a world that was richer, purer, and a lot more fun in lower tech form. Here, too, the actors often look artificially superimposed against their CG backdrops, though the intensity of the fakery generates its own visual fascination. Raimi opted to use practical sets in conjunction with computer-generated imagery during filming. Physical sets were constructed so that actors could have a visual reference as opposed to using green screen technology for every scene. Chroma key compositing was only used for background pieces. And you can really tell, like, the it feels like feels like you you know yeah like technically you you can yeah you can tell that when they were filming like you know let there's there's a scene where like they're they're standing two characters are standing two human characters live action are standing on this like they're they're high up above the city and off in the background you can see the city and the city like I'm not sure I would say that it looked fake, but I could, you know, I realized, okay, that's almost definitely fake. But as they're walking, like, they have, you know, the the, the stuff they're walking on, and there's, like, guardrail, uh, not guardrail, whatever, you know, stuff to, like, so that it's, you can't just accidentally step over, and, you know, and clearly that was real, like, I... I forget if the actors particularly did touch, like reach out and touch the the guardrail, not guardrail thing, but certainly it was clear to me from watching the actors' performances that if they wanted to, if they thought it would make sense for the performance, they could and they would. And again, that just yeah, it it felt like they were. At, at times felt like real places. Zach Braff and Joey King were on set recording their dialogues simultaneously with the other actors whenever their CG characters were present in a scene. Puppetry was employed for a physical version of China Girl to serve as visual key point for actors to manipulate. Braff wore a blue motion capture suit to create Finley's movements and had a camera close to his face for the flying sequences to obtain facial movements. Yeah, it, it really shows. It feels so much more real. So the budget was 200 million and yeah, estimated somewhere between 200 and 250 million 
15, not 50. And the box office worldwide was 493.3 million. And that is technically, like, to you or I, that sounds pretty good. I wouldn't mind that money. But technically, that's not... Like, it could be a lot better. You know, a movie can't just make back its budget and then make a... You know, the, the making back the budget, that's, that's not profit, technically. That's just balancing. You know, and after that, you have 293 million. So the movie earned... You know, it earned back the budget, and then it earned, you know, it has a profit of what the budget was. That's not quite considered, like, super successful in Hollywood. And, you know, I mean, it is worth noting that technically, supposedly, they, you know, some people would like to make a sequel to this. But in nine years, you know, they haven't even started production yet. You know, when you think about how quickly some movies that are popular get sequels, that's kind of a long time, and yeah. I would definitely say you can see the budget on screen, like the the money is is there in in effects and the the various like the actual sets, the actual props and costumes and such. Now, let's see. So this was filmed, let's see, in the, yeah, this was filmed in some studios rather than on real sets particularly. IMDb Trivia says that Robert Stromberg studied the films of Frank Capra, James Warren Howe, to achieve the appropriate Art Deco design for the Emerald City of Oz. Art director Robert Stromberg cited the Disney animated films Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Bambi, Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Sleeping Beauty as an influence on Oz's landscape design. And quick fellow critics here. Visually, the film is a delight. Sam Raimi turns Oz into its own wonderland without it ever seeming predictable or tired. One criticism I had of Tim Burton's Alice was that it didn't really give the audience a chance to luxuriate in the bizarre landscapes of Underland all that much. It had great character designs, but the landscape seemed a bit low-key. Raimi, on the other hand, gives audiences exactly what they're looking for. Gems, flowers, waterfalls, mountains, rock formations, sunsets, etc., that are completely breathtaking. Not only that, but the CGI is crisp and clean. Absolutely agreed. The Land of Oz is indeed magical, with vibrant colors around every corner. Memorable spots like the poppy fields and the dark forest for us older viewers, but even in saying all that, I can't help but feel how fake it all is. This film suffers from the same troubles that plagued Burton's Alice in Wonderland. The visuals, although great for the story, add no, re no sense of realism to the image. I hate overly used CGI films to the point of noticing the awkward placement of actors in front of the green screen. The first major offender of this is Star Wars Attack of the Clones. None of the actors made me believe they were in the settings they were. Both Wonderland and Oz have this same feeling. To an extent, for sure. I don't, I wouldn't go quite as far as he does. Now, some critics have said this isn't really much of an action movie. I agree. I, th I think it, you know... I, I would call it more of an action adventure. Now that brings us to the villains slash antagonists. I'm not going to give away exactly who plays yeah in in before I get into the thought sections. But what I will say is they are very memorable at times very charismatic, and at other times we absolutely love to hate the, the villains. And yeah, the, the music 
The score is handled by Danny Elfman, who has 48 credits as the music department for a movie. For TV, it's 27. For video game, it's 16. For video, it's 14. For short, it's 6. Documentary, it's 1. Composer for movie, it's 101. And, yeah, he's, you know, I don't know that I need to spend very long explaining the kind of music that he does. Let's just say it makes a lot of sense for him to do something like this. You know, he does these fantastical movies, and, yeah, you know, he's worked with Raimi before, he's versatile, you know, yeah, the soundtrack has a sense of wonder and adventure. I listen to, I want to say all of it on, here on, right here on YouTube, which it's, it's worth sitting down and doing. It's, it legitimately is a pleasant experience to just listen to. Now. According to Wikipedia, in June 2011, composer Danny Elfman was chosen to score the film despite Elfman and Raimi having fallen out over Spider-Man 2 and Elfman having declared they would never again work together. He noted that the film score was excessively quick to produce, with the majority of the music being written in six weeks. Regarding the tonal quality of the score, Elfman stated, We're going to take an approach that's old school, but not self-consciously old-fashioned. Let the melodrama be melodrama, let everything be what it is. I also think there's the advantage that I'm able to write narratively, and when I'm able to write narratively, I can also move quicker because that's my natural instincts. I can tell the story in the music. So, according to film critic, Danny Elfman's score was okay. One thing I've noticed with him lately is that almost everything he does now sounds less and less unique. We've got the requisite haunting waltz and the spectacular pounding, swirling opening credits theme, but other than that, I found almost everything to be a bit forgettable, which is sad, because Elfman is one of my favorite film composers. The music isn't bad, but it just doesn't add as much as it could have. That is a fair point, yeah. The sound design is excellent. Like, Oz has a lot of things that we don't have in real life, and yeah, they sound... Like, the, the yeah, the sound design for them makes you feel like it's somehow real. Now, some critics say the movie is not perfectly paced, and that's definitely, yeah, it's, the pacing is awkward. Now, without end credits, the movie is two hours, four and a half minutes long. With them, it's around two hours, 13 minutes. That's the, the Disney Plus, you know, that, I think that includes the, the, the dubbed languages credits. But yeah, you know, if, if you're not interested in, you know, maybe 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. Or to move away from a, a number thing, once Oscar gets to Oz, you know, give it, let's go with five or ten minutes. And if by the end of that, you still haven't seen anything that makes you hopeful for the rest of the movie, then you can go ahead and switch it off. So, I think the, the best thing is probably Sam Raimi's Oz visuals. And if you're a big fan of Sam Raimi, like I am, I would say it's worth watching at least once. Certainly if you have Disney+. Plus, If, if it's just a time investment, then, you know, you can always get a, a time transplant down the line. I would definitely say it's, it's worth, yeah. If you're not really a fan of him, probably not, no. And, but yeah, like hypothetically, let's say I had a time travel machine and I could go back in time, you know, several hours to to either 
you know, to, to talk to myself about watching this movie to either say, don't do it, bad idea, or be like, you're going to love it, you know. Yeah, it's closer to you're going to love it, definitely. The worst aspect is probably the, the bad acting and also the, yeah, it's a tie between the bad acting and when the effects are bad. Now, when I read other people's reviews, a common compla complaint was a lot of people found that it was too predictable. Which, yeah, that is that is an issue. I was most worried that it would be as bad as the 2010's Alice in Wonderland movie. It was nowhere near as, as bad as that. I was most looking forward to seeing a Sam Raimi movie that I hadn't seen before, and, you know, it's slightly watered-down discount Sam Raimi, but it's still a lot better. Like, Sam Raimi, on a bad day, is still better than a lot of other directors at their best. Now, the trailers do give too much away, but they do also give you an idea of, you know, what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if not. The cover and poster do not give too much away, but do give you an, a good idea of what the movie is like. So, here on YouTube, I found about a dozen and a half reviews several trailers, a handful of music videos, some of them fan-made, including one appropriately using Pink's So What as the Wicked Witch of the West sort of theme music, I guess. I also happened to find the full riff track for The Wonderful Land of Oz. It's legit. It's on the Riff Tracks official channel. And as the case for most MST3K and all of the other riff tracks, I know it's hilarious. You should watch it. So yeah, the on Rotten Tomatoes, this only has a 57 critic rating based on 273 reviews and a 56% audience score based on over a quarter million ratings. The critics' consensus is that it suffers from some tonal inconsistency and a deflated sense of wonder, but Oz the Written Powerful still packs enough visual dazzle and clever wit to be entertaining in its own right. And the... Uh, yeah, for the, for the critic reviews, the average rating is 6.00 out of 10, and of the 273, only 155 are fresh. The remaining 118 are rotten. So, yeah. And the audience score, the average rating is 3.4 out of 5. So, that's, that could be a lot worse. But yeah, the movie is rotten on Rotten Tomatoes. And on Metacritic, it's 44 out of 100, which is also a kind of mediocre score. The user... Uh, yeah, the user rating is 6.1 out of 10. When I checked the last user reviews, were from November 18th, 2021. 42 Metacritic critic reviews and 165 user reviews. And IMDb, there, there were only 558 user reviews, despite the movie being so recent. So that kind of suggests that not that many people cared about it. Like, in 2013, people were putting movie, putting user reviews on IMDb. So that's, that's how few people cared back then, not only since, but also back then. Like, it's, it's another thing, if you find, like, a movie from, like, the 70s, and there aren't that many reviews, well... The internet didn't exist back then, you know, people, it, it was, it was actually a very sad time because people, before they had the internet, they would just sit and stare at the screen and have to kind of imagine what it would be like to have the internet, just, yeah.
Now, the, yeah, so of the top voted 100 MDB user reviews, nine of them voted 1 out of 10, no one voted 2 out of 10, 6, 3 out of 10, also 6, 4 out of 10, 4, 4, 5 out of 10, 9, 6 out of 10, 15, 7 out of 10, 12, 8 out of 10, 10, 9 out of 10, 33, 10 out of 10. So, yeah, the most popular reviews are very positive, but, yeah. But it has a 6.3 out of 10 based on over 205,000 MDB user votes. 25.6% gave it 7, 249 gave it 6, 13.1% gave it 5, 13.1% gave it 8, 6.0% gave it 4, so yeah. And yeah, I gotta say the the Yeah, as far as violence goes, violence and gore, let's be honest, it simply would not be a Sam Raimi movie other than his Spider-Man movies if there was absolutely no limbs that have been severed either before or during the movie, and don't get me started on all the limbs severed in the books that I learned about in researching this, but PG, so what to do? Well... You could simply choose to have the limbs that are severed be not human. Instead, it's the adorable little humanoid creatures, because as we all know, if there's one thing children love to see in movies, it's for the adorable creatures that they sympathize with to be mutilated. But yeah, honestly, I could imagine a lot of kids were probably pretty freaked out when they saw China Girl, but yeah... I, I do not understand how this got passed on anything less than a PG-13, but, yeah. So that brings us... Right. If you are reading people's written reviews of this, I recommend Outlaw Vern, although note that he swears and uses other mature concepts in his reviews, and Marianne Johansson. Now... So, on Disney Plus, it has the following extras. Five minutes of quite funny bloopers. A 21 and a half minute behind the scenes, interesting enough, behind the scenes video called My Journey in Oz by James Franco. A 10-minute informative video called Walt Disney and the Road to Oz, which basically explains, you know, these things about how they wanted to make a movie, copyright law, and, you know, yeah. So, you know, if you don't already have Disney+, Plus and you already have access to the movie, I wouldn't say, don't get Disney Plus just to watch the, the extras, the way that I would say for a lot of MCU movies, for example. But yeah, depending on your country, you can stream it on Disney Plus here on YouTube, Google Play, via Play. So, at the end of the day, when I have to be brutally honest, when rating this movie, it does come down to six reasons why Sam Raimi took the longest break from making movies in his career up to this point out of ten. And yeah, so I I like to try to talk about you know what would have made me rate it higher. 
Mila Kunis should, you know, yeah. I, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, Olivia Wilde, various actresses that were considered for witches. They would, they would all have done a better job than Mila Kunis. She was miscast. She's talented, but she was miscast. I would also say James Franco should have been recast. I'm not sure Johnny Depp was the way to go, but certainly someone other than James Franco. The effects should have been, there, there should have been a little bit less focus on the effects because they still, you know, by 2013, that much CGI, there was still going to be some that would look off. The, the plot should have been less predictable. The many scenes of, like, you know, chasing or creepiness or various things should have been justified more by the script. I guess that might be about... Yeah, and, and the characters, you know, it's probably more writing than acting because most of the acting is really, really good. And certainly, Michelle Williams and Rachel Weisz are both excellent. But some of the characters, the writing should have been better so that the characters would end up more memorable than they are by, you know, in, in the end product. But again, I enjoyed watching it. You know, it got the, yeah, when it was supposed to be funny, I laughed. When it was supposed to be scary, I was like, oh, this is intense. I the movie got to me when it was supposed to be emotional, you know, the, yeah. And that brings us to spoiler sections. So from here on out, we're in the thoughts section. So yeah, the rest of the video contains spoilers, both for this movie and the 1939 original. The rest of this video is not a review, a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis, some of the MST, MST3K riff tracks and other jokes, especially jokes in the next thoughts section. Time codes for all the sections in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can give us a running commentary, live tweeting, and the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. So let's dive in. Notes taken while watching. I quite appreciate that the magic show at the start is shown both from the audience's perspective and we see what Frank does. Like the, I, I just don't think the movie would have, the scene would have been as compelling if we either only saw the trickery that Frank does or the audience that, you know, like for the audience, it seems legitimately convincing. It is legitimately heartbreaking seeing Joey King go from believing in the show to doubting because of the wires to believing in again to asking Oscar to make her walk and then realizing that that isn't going to happen. Like, she really gives a very strong performance in this. It's a woman. You want me to wind up a music box? Underlying that he does this all the time. We already knew that he was lying to the other girl when he gave her the music box and talking about, oh, you know, it was my grandmother's. It's the only thing left from her. She died in the war of Kaplaka. Which, just, dude, you don't have to lie to her. She did not die at the Battle of Kaplaka. She died at the historic battle of Klaatu Baratu. No, oh, come on, I said it right. 
you knew it had to be just a matter of time. You know, but yeah, so so Frank is like, okay, here we go, you know, and and we see that Oscar actually does care more about her. He respects her more than, than that. And I do also, like, it was kind of amusing when Frank is like, you know, oh, the, the last girl left here with a broken heart. And, and Oscar's like, attack, heart attack. But she's in hospital, and they're saying she'll make a full recovery. Would you like to join her? You know, he's, he's slimy, and we really want him to change. And thankfully, by the end of the movie, he does appear to have changed. I do appreciate that... I think her name was Annie. You know, Oscar does tell Annie, John Gale is a good man. You know, you should marry him. You know, because he asked. And 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 the the partner of the strong man talks about the music box, and then the volunteer girl realizes, oh, he does this all the time. And I appreciate you know both Oscar and the strong man have obstacles in their path, and Oz. Oscar only barely manages to cut the rope before the strong man gets him when he's in the hot air balloon. Like, it was extremely, you know, they were pulling on the rope, and his hand is like, you know, ah, which is also, it's a Sam Raimi movie, so of course there's going to be a hand grabbing out at someone. Holy crap, that thing has got to be packed to the brim with hot air. And now it's riding in a hot air balloon. Very cool sequence with the tornado. I like that it goes back and forth between seeming like he might actually make it and then seeming like, okay, he definitely won't. You know, there's the, the vehicle that, like, I, I forget what they're called, but you have to, like, pull the, not, not pull, you have to turn this lever and it'll play music. And, you know, at first it just floats through the air past him playing the music normally, and then as it goes further away, it kind of drifts off. And then suddenly it plays it very aggressively when it comes right at him, right at the camera. And then, like, all the wooden board things stabbing at him when in, inside the, the, uh, the little squ square part that he's in, you know, in, in the higher balloon. Which is also, you know, something jutting out and attacking a character, Sam Raimi. And then it seems to calm down. And, and, you know, he's, he sort of lands, but then he ends up river rafting in the hot air balloon and going down a waterfall. The tree where it turns out to have been red butterflies instead of leaves covering all the branches is a great visual. And in general, the sequence on the water has some truly memorable sights. I can't swim. Somebody help me. Turns out the water isn't very deep. That's a decent enough funny joke. Where's Dave Chappelle to talk about how the water isn't very deep? What's a river fairy? Patient little thing that knows to wait for its cue is what it is. And the river fairy clearly wants him to finish the whistle, so he does, and then just spits water in his face. Wouldn't be a Sam Raimi movie if someone didn't get something, typically liquid, sprayed on their face. And Theodora tells Oscar about Glinda. And, you know, the audience is told, you know, at this point in the mythology, the witches live in the Emerald City rather than the wizard. And, yeah, you know, like immediately, if you watch the 1939 movie, and this movie is made mainly for people who have you know, immediately we're thinking, oh, that's, there's something wrong. That's not how it should be. And Theodore 
lets her hair down and Oz gets out a music box. Good thing green is my favorite color. You might not be glad that you said that. I've got to admit, Finley going so overboard in trying to convince people that this is the real wizard before they get in the carriage, that legitimately cracked me up. Like, just, you know, he did. At first, he's just announcing, this is the wizard that we've been waiting for. And Oscar's like, that'll work. That's okay. We're good. Just, you know, cut the mic. I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll take it from here. You know. And then he goes on, you know, Finley goes on with, he's definitely not just a cheat. No ulterior motive whatsoever. This guy is trustworthy. We don't have to worry at all. You know, all this kind of, yeah, I, I don't remember it exactly, so I'm spitballing, but yeah. Or snowballing, depending on, but yeah, the, the, I think Catman does a pretty good catchphrase. And as soon as as soon as Oscar is gone from the throne room, Evanora shows her true colors. She doesn't trust Oscar as the wizard, and then she calls Theodora first naive and then in league with Galinda. You know, that really very, very nicely done. Like she she knows that you know, when Oscar comes in and Theodora is like, this is the wizard. You know, Evanora is like smiling and reaching out her hand while internally screaming, what is wrong with you, sister? How did you fall for this? You know, but she knows that if she just says that, that's not going to work. You know, she needs to manipulate him. Because she does realize at the end of the day, there is some chance that, he, you know, wizard or not, there is some chance that he'll be able to separate Glinda from her wand, and that's all they need. You know, like, hypothetically, if, if Oscar manages that, and then he turns out not to be the wizard, that just means he's easier to get rid of. That's why she doesn't just kick him out and say, get, would you get out of the king's chair? What is wrong with, you know, but the moment that she sees him do it, she's like, yes, get comfortable. See if how, how it is, if it is to your liking, you know, and, and then afterwards she's talking to Theodora. She's like, you let that oof sit in the king's chair, you know, just really, really good. Just, Yeah. She's, she gives such a good performance in this. She's such a good actress. And, yeah, you know, Evanora doesn't really accept that he's a wizard, so it fades from, from a relative close-up of her face, and then Evanora and Oscar are walking down, you know, yeah, walking, and she says, you know, she, she basically tries to get him to prove that he's a wizard and he says you know there's there's a time for for everything then this is not the time something like that and you know she yeah she basically realizes okay, this guy's the wizard so in again you know at this point she could just be like you know okay just get get out of here you know if you see the wizard tell tell him to hurry up because we're getting really tired of waiting but get out of here we know you're not the wizard stop pretending but instead she's like so if he's not the wizard but he wants us to think that he is if i tell him that he can have all of this gold if he kills glinda he's gonna try and he might actually succeed and that you know just yeah really really good and and you know not a surprise to see oscar scrooge mcduck in the treasure room and evanora waits until he's shown a strong desire for the treasure 
before telling him that he only gets it if he kills Glinda. And then really underlines that he gets nothing if not, you know, he's like, I don't really want to kill. Oh, you know what? It's f fair enough. No throne, no treasure, no, you know, oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. It's just, you know, because if she just said, you know, if you, if you aren't willing to kill this person, there's absolutely nothing, you know, you're, you're not getting anything. Then he's going to be like, okay, well, I'm not killing anybody. But once he's already shown, yeah. And so they see the smoke in the distance. That looks bad. I don't know, I think the effects are decent enough. And Oz glues the China girl's legs back on, which is legitimately sweet. And every so often we'll see flying monkeys and such, so that's what... If Okay, if I understand correctly, Evanora sends out flying monkeys to look for Glinda, and so Glinda is hiding in the dark forest where some of the creatures will protect her. I guess it's supposed to, yeah. So the China girl goes from being someone we really sympathize with to being comically annoying when she's like holding on to Oz's leg, crying, and then revealing that she's dangerous, you know, she she hums, let's go kill a witch, you know, and she's got this little, actually that might be a, a little bit, I forget if it's exactly then, but she's got this adorable little china knife, which is just, yeah, 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 the, the, yeah, that's coming up, anyway, tons of glowing yellow eyes, open behind Oscar and the others and close the moment he turns back to look on multiple occasions that was also legitimately like a, you know yeah it was it was creepy and it kind of made me chuckle when he turned and they would all close those things are genuinely scary biting at the trio it's got a knife I'm made of China I've got to do something to protect myself Honestly, honestly yourself. China girl, you are the squiggly line. I want to be a heart. Can I be a heart? Priorities. She's got priorities. What's going on? I don't know. I sneezed the plan away. Here's your wand. I'm sorry I mooed. Now, I saw someone say that it doesn't make sense that Theodore's tears scar her face because she must have cried when she was a baby. I don't know if maybe the idea is supposed to be that she's never been in love before now that she's, you know, yeah, now she's crying because she feels betrayed by the one she was in love with. That's those are the tears that hurt her, but then in 1939 she dies just from having water poured on her, so maybe they just didn't think about that she would definitely have cried before. And wasn't there also some water? Didn't some water get on her when they were at the cave? I feel like that must have been. So, why exactly was there a flying monkey? Like, when, when Theodora and Oscar get into the cave, is that... Oh, I guess, actually, I guess it's supposed to be that the flying monkey thinks that he's the wizard and thus is there to kill him so the prophecy won't be fulfilled. Fair enough. That makes sense. Are you going to jump off a cliff just because she jumped off a cliff? I have wings. It's a pretty good counterpoint to the whole, if everyone jumped off a cliff, cliff, would you? I really appreciate that several seconds pass between Oz jumping off a cliff and us realizing that he's in one of those flying bubble things. And it's also like, I mean, I don't know magic. But I feel like it wouldn't have killed Glinda to say 
if you jump off this cliff, you know, you will be caught by something that will help you fly, you know, but yeah. We're going too fast. I'm going to die. All good hearts and souls get to pass through. I'm going to die. That is legitimately funny. Like, he's like, oh, I am not a good soul. I really like that for, like, two seconds, it does look like he's not going to be allowed through the wall. It looks like it stops him. Like, between him saying, I'm going to die, there's maybe four or five seconds. But once it hit, like, if this is the bubble... And this is the wall, you know, it goes like, and then eventually slips through, you know, but, and, you know, it, does, it doesn't just go through immediately. It, it slows down. Maybe he needs his heart balanced. I can also tell you're weak, egotistical, and kind of a fibber. Did they think that the word liar was too strong? Or I guess maybe it fits the aesthetic to use fibber instead. Can you make them believe? Will I still get their gold? Confirming he's still doing this for the wrong reasons. And Theodora is looking at the crystal ball, clearly upset. What's the matter, sister? We have so much gold, I don't understand why we can't spring for a cable. You only have one channel on this thing. It's ridiculous. One bite, and we'll share the throne. Unless you'd rather see Oz and Glinda there. The kind of things people tell their relatives to get them to eat some fruit. Theodore becoming the Wicked Witch, especially that shot of her green hand you know, clawing the table, and then the silhouette are legitimately decently creepy. Theodora makes one heck of an entrance at the Emerald City. And Theodora takes control of Oscar's body, waving him around in the air. She only killed a man, not what he believed in. So what you're saying is that Beneath this mask is an idea, and ideas are bulletproof. I'm just a con man from a con family. Someone needs to tuck me in. My papa used to do it, but he's now been reduced to a pile of dust. It's the kind of wizard I like to be, and he's inspired to fight back. Good character moment. So when he was first introduced to the people, he didn't think much of them, but now he's putting their skills to good use. I like it. It wouldn't be a Sam Raimi movie without a visually impressive montage. Do you know how to build a hot air balloon? Suggesting he's still gonna run. The only person you've got fooled is yourself. Bruce Campbell is only on camera for maybe 30 seconds, in which time he gets hit on the head like four times. Because this is the Sam Raimi movie. It is really cool when we see the flying monkeys tearing apart what are then revealed to be scarecrows. Now, I've seen some people question why do the monkeys fly into the poppy field since they know, you know, they know that's where the poppy is. They know what poppy is, what effect it has on people. I think the idea is supposed to be that they're too hot-tempered. That's their weakness. That's why they lose. The monkeys as well as Theodora. You know, it's it's this sort of morality tale that if you, if you rush in, if you can't control your temper, you're going to ruin things. You know, the, the, they lose the entire army of flying monkeys because of that. You know, you'll, you'll note that right before the flying monkeys are sent out. I forget if it's Avenora or Theodora, but one of them looks at what appears to be an army marching on them and speaks the line, they dare march on us. The, the you know, the goal. They're, they're just, they can't believe it. This is, this is so insulting. You know, this cannot stand. 
so they try to yeah you know they 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 act without thinking you know really what they should have been you know if if they had proper control of their temper they should have gone they're really gonna march on us that doesn't make any sense we have way more military than they do you know and then it would have like imagine imagine if it got all the way through if if the scarecrows on wagons were moved all the way up to the castle then what you know it's not like they can actually get in and it's possible that they would still be hidden by the fog but it is the ah what's the word it would still it wouldn't accomplish anything you know they they wouldn't be able to break down walls or climb walls or break down a door or something and that's you know they should have called their bluff if they were in control of their temper, but I appreciate the characterization that they aren't. Another thing is that Eva Nora, you know, she meets this person that she says, this can't be the wizard. Even though she's aware that other people think he is. And instead of doing the clever, wise thing, of saying, if people think he's the wizard, then he's dangerous to me. I gotta get rid of him. Instead of doing that, she says, I think I can use him. I think he can do something for me. I, I can trick him. I can manipulate him. And because of that, she actually, like, he doesn't become an actual wizard. But she gives him the, like, once he encounters Glinda and she convinces him to try to fight, she, you know, Oscar becomes Evanora's greatest enemy outside of Glinda herself. You know, the events of the movie would not have happened if Evanora had, like, the moment that she saw this guy that she was convinced wasn't the wizard. Like, imagine, imagine if she used that green, green? No, wait, no, it's not green, is it? What, whatever. The lightning that she has. Imagine that she started using that on him and just kept using it on him until he either passes out or croaks, which is what a frog does when it's struck by lightning. And at that point, you know, she no longer has a problem with him. But no, she you know she sends him out even though she knows even her own sister was fooled you know a, a witch was fooled so of course regular people are going to be fooled and Evanora taunts Glinda and uses lightning on her she's such you know we we really love to hate her like I could not wait to see her lose I, I will say, if they make a sequel to this, I, I hope Rachel Weisz reprises a role, or that they otherwise get someone that can do a really good job, because she was really, really fun in this. That's, you know, and it is nice to get some characterization for a character. Like, if you only watch the 1939 movie, if you don't read the books, I can imagine that the books flesh out her character. But in the 1939 version, it's just, oh, she was a witch. She had ruby slippers which are magic and can be used to transport yourself home. That's it. That's all we know. And the hot air balloon is destroyed. China Girl and Glinda cry. I guess for it to work as the heroes at our lowest end moment, we have to think that the many inconsistencies with the old movie mean that this isn't actually a prequel at all, since otherwise, obviously, you know that the wizard comes back. And is still human, so yeah. Anyway, I'm not gonna lie; it kind of it got to me a little bit. I've seen some say, "Why didn't Theodora just kill Oscar and, uh, uh, 
was Glinda there? I forget. But certainly Oscar, when she first appeared to threaten, I agree that part of it is so that the heroes would have time to foil their plan. You know, that's why the screenwriter decided it. That's part of the reason. But part of it is that they legitimately think they have nothing to fear. And if time passes between the threat being made and it being carried out, that leaves time for fear to fester, to really demoralize the people. Like, if it's just immediately carried out, then it just won't have the same effect. Like, think about it. This is a world without cameras and audio recordings and such. We know that because they are amazed at his projection machine. They are amazed at the idea that, like, China Girl is like, you can, like, moving pictures? Really? You know, which today, like, that's why they call it a motion picture. It's a picture in motion. The word movie is, you know, short for moving picture. So, today we take it completely for granted, but in their world, imagine she shows up, immediately kills him, fly, you know, says why she killed him, flies away. Some of the people are going to be so shocked at the fact that they saw, um, you know, this killing so close that they're not going to completely process why, why did it happen, you know. Because they've never seen a green-skinned witch before. They've never, like, they only just met Oscar recently and were told that he's the wizard. But then think about what, like, if hypothetically, if the movie actually ended with Theodora killing Oscar all those hours later, or a day later, however long it is. Think about being one of those villagers. Imagine this green witch shows up and starts, like, saying these vicious things and say, you know, he's going to die. And then, yeah, you know, hours or a day later or something, when everybody in the village has told everybody else and has talked about, do you think she's, she, she's really going to do it? Why is, you know, what what is going on? And then it actually happens. Then everybody's going to remember. But if it just, yeah, yeah, I've made my point. And let's see. We see... Yeah, all the all the what was that? Oh, right. All the spears go right through Oscar's head, and we see that he's uh, the smoke face, and we see that he's sitting inside the machine. Finley's providing the audio effects, like Frank. Turn it back on, and then it doesn't work. But they do manage to fix it, thankfully. And Theodore is just about to kill Glinda, who uses magic to escape, getting the wand back just in time from Shiny Girl. Which, you know, the the abridged script points out that's the one thing, you know, China Girl picks up a thing and hands it to another character, and Finley actually doesn't do anything. You know, okay, yeah, he does he does the audio effects, but you know, anybody could have done that. Cool witches duel. Look what you've done to me. I realize that the idea that unattractive people are evil and attractive people are good, or at least so it is for witches, is in the original movie, but it still is really frustrating that this movie sends that message to children. Hi, Glinda. We finally learned her name. If that doesn't make you smile and squint. And the gifts that... Oz gives go back and forth between being sweet and being meh and I th I mean I think it's that the movie doesn't want to commit to being kind of sentimental you know the 1939 movie isn't afraid of being sentimental when 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 he's giving the gifts but in this one you know oh we got to be postmodern we got to deconstruct and be self-aware I, I think the movie, the scene would have worked better if it was either all sweet or all meh. So yeah, after spending the whole movie being a fake for his own gain and running away from responsibilities, the ending is him using his trickery to keep other people safe. And basically he says that if more people, like he's going to keep protecting them 
with these illusions. So, you know, that is, yeah, th that's character growth. And that is, it's not nothing, but it is still kind of frustrating with these kinds of stories. But, yeah. That brings us to the very next section, the very final section, entitled Notes Taken Before Watching. So, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? Ultimately, I'm not sure I would really say the movie has empathy for Evanora. And other than the fact that she is rendered unattractive by the end, I do think that largely that was the right choice. Now. Yeah, so the there's a bit where Finley says that it's a vicious stereotype that monkeys love bananas and then afterwards he says of course I love bananas I'm a monkey don't be ridiculous I just don't like you saying it replace bananas with fried chicken monkey with black many you know non-white people or many Many white people already call black people and other non-white people monkeys, and it's openly racist, so that's really frustrating. And I get, I'm, I'm aware that there are China doll people in the books, but using Chinatown as a, a verbal joke is still, like, Chinese identity is not a joke. I realize it's it's possible, I don't know for sure, if they're called Chinatown in the books. If if the place is called Chinatown in the books, that still wouldn't make it okay. And it's really I really did not like that Oscar keeps referring to Nuck as sourpuss. I get it. I get it. He's saying, you know. This, this guy never smiles, but it's uncomfortable to me because it is a white person refusing to call a black person by their real name, trying to change their name. And he also, like, routinely treats these various characters badly. You know, both Nuck and Finley, he basically just pushes around. Now, the end of this movie implies that all of this did really happen, even though the original movie specifically ended with her waking up, and it seemed like it must have been a dream, but that was because back then too many people wouldn't accept a woman being the lead of an adventure like that in a movie, even though a woman is the lead in the books where the stories were not a dream. But then, in this, it's a man, so it's okay. And, you know, given that, you know, it, it doesn't really make sense that there are real-life Oz counterparts in this movie when it's not a dream. And it seems like they didn't really fully think that through. I do think that these are more interesting if, you know, I guess technically you could interpret the 1939 original as it did happen it wasn't just a dream i think it's most interesting if it's either revealed to be real or there is a chance that it could be real i don't think it's that interesting for something like that to just be a dream unless it's going to be something like Ah, what's the what's the word? Like, if it's just a story where someone has to learn a lesson, then it's fine for it to just be a dream. But yeah, 
Now it is very frustrating how they deal with the backstory of the Wicked Witch of the West. She's evil because she was manipulated, lied to, and poisoned by her sister because she fell in love with James Franco. Because girls are like that. They're silly. They fall in love and suddenly they're doing awful, awful things. And it's necessary for a lot of men to work together to make sure that these women don't do too much damage. It's just, it's really gross and sexist. And... Yeah, basically, Oscar flirts with every, you know, every girl that he meets that he finds attractive, which leads to Mila Kunis becoming a villain, but he doesn't seem to care that much about her. I'm not sure I would really say that he faces consequences. It's kind of just like, you know, if you're a straight man watching this movie, you can imagine yourself as Oscar, and yeah, sure, Every so often you'll get in trouble because you flirt with everyone and every woman finds you super attractive. But at the end of the day, there's not really going to be any consequences. And I just, they could have actually, like, I think this movie would have been heartbreaking if the ending was that because Mila Kunis, because Theodora could tell that Oscar didn't care that he had hurt her, she would be like, I'll pr I'll show you what it's like to hurt. I'll take some, someone from, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hurt someone you care about. And she, you know, yeah, she, she like gets her hands on China girl and like, let's see, I, it's, I'm going to try to keep it PG. Um, let's see. I guess probably, yeah, I shouldn't go too, too harsh on, but yeah, like, let's say that uh, she uses some kind of dark magic that Glinda can't reverse to turn her into just uh, a statue of, or a real doll so that she now like she can she can maybe still feel but she can't move and she can't she can't do anything you know that kind of thing i think that would have been and and you know oscar is horrified that would have been a more compelling ending like oscar says you know if you you you're you're free to return you know if you change if if you stop being evil or whatever it is he says and she screeches never and flies off. And, you know, the editing room's bridge script points out, apparently he and Glinda don't do anything about the two witches ruling entire parts of the land of Oz with cruelty. Now... Yeah, so quoting a fellow critic, I'm not entirely sure why they needed the James why they needed Oscar Oscar's help. It seems like they were able to handle themselves or should have been. I think it's supposed to be that the regular people have so much faith in the prophecy it might actually be supposed to be satire that a lot of people are not gonna believe that things are going right if there's not a man apparently in control. So yeah, that's that's a decent point. But it's possible it's also just that I'm overanalyzing as I'm wont to do and it's just that they actually think yeah yeah quoting a, a, a critic when Mila Kunis tries to sound evil it just sounds like Meg from Family Guy not enough threat there so yeah <laughs> okay so yeah quoting a fellow critic I hate this movie. I hate this version of the Wicked Witch of the West. There are things about this movie that aren't the worst thing ever. In fact, it could have been passably boring. But every decision made about the Wicked Witch of the West is the worst they could have made. Every major female character is defined by female stereotypes, negative ones. They're easy to manipulate or they manipulate others. They are jealous. Glinda has way too much faith in Oscar. The 1939 film and this are both about blind faith. Yet another liar revealed plot. The general girl was adorable, really got to me emotionally. I so badly wanted her to be fixed once I heard her backstory. Let's see. 
Yeah, the, okay, so the following is just a quote. Uh, yeah. Quote from the editing room's abridged script is excellent. Then some evil flying monkeys show up and chase them right to the edge of a cliff. They lose the monkeys by flying away. James Franco. What? Wait a minute. How come flying allowed us to lose pursuers who can also fly? Michelle Williams. It doesn't make sense, I know, but how else were we going to get a away from the bad guys? Now hold on, we're about to pass through the impenetrable anti-bad guy force field. Yeah. And, yeah, another part from that. Monkey Zack Braff. Of course, it was all part of the trick. He knew that Mila would see him loading the balloon with riches, and then stop watching so she didn't see him send the balloon off by itself, and that the autopiloted balloon would drift in this direction, and the witches would destroy it so that it would land exactly on the spot where his equipment was set up, but not damage any of said equipment. It makes perfect sense. Michelle Williams, now be gone. The both of you leave this place and go conquer a quarter of the country each and run it with an iron fist while James and I apparently do nothing to stop you for years to come. There it is. Michelle Williams portraying a good witch, Emilia Kunis being the Wicked Witch of the West, Green Skin, is such an obvious twist that no one falls for it. Yeah, I mean, the moment that you hear that Michelle Williams is playing a witch, I mean, did anybody believe she was going to be playing one of the evil witches? I mean, it's it's obvious from basically right away that Evanora has to be one of the two wicked witches. And, yeah, I, I'm not sure I would really say... Yeah, I th I think it's it's quite obvious that it it's makes more sense for or makes more sense based on the the way the characters are written. It seems more like yeah, it's it's probably Mila Kunis, not Michelle Williams, who's evil or turns evil. But yeah, so I want to hear what you think. Which is the best Oz movie? Should they make more movies based on the books? Which book do you think is the best book to adapt into a movie? Are you hoping that we will eventually get a direct sequel to this movie? Who are you, what, what cast members are you hoping will return? What, what should be the plot? Let me know. And if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video if you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoiler-filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is Moon Knight, and one talking about my spoiler-filled thoughts on the episode of The Mandalorian that I've personally finally gotten around to watching, and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. So if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoy watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.